You are listening to Salty Believer Unscripted, a conversation on Christian ministry and the Christian life. This is Salty Believer Unscripted. I'm Brian Catherman. And this is Jared Jenkins. Woohoo! Back on back <laughs> at it again. Yeah. All right. I liked I liked the conversation we had in the last episode, Jared. I think it was it's so nuanced and so difficult that I'm sure a lot of people are thinking through that. And, and I failed to do a couple of things. If you're listening and you have some questions for us, you can email me at saltybeliever at gmail.com or you can go to saltybeliever.com and there's a forum there. If you're in the Salt Lake area, maybe you're a climber, maybe you somehow stumbled onto that or whatever, and you're anywhere in Utah and you want to connect with Jared, Jared, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, you can connect with me at the Risen Life Church website. So www.risenlifeutah.org. My email address is on there and you can you can email me. Awesome. Sweet. So if people have questions, because that was that's a big topic we talked about last time. If you yeah. didn't listen, I want to encourage, go back and listen to it. I think this one's going to be equally as kind of difficult to get our head around, but I think it's maybe more important than the false gospel we talked about before. We're talking about a sense of idolatry, but this one impacts Christians really, really pretty ferociously. Jared, yeah. I want to talk about the the false political gospel or or like the, it's it's idolatry that's all surrounded in and swirling in the politics and the political process and the political system. And now there's a lot of popular words with this, like Christian nationalism and yeah. the others. But really, ultimately, I want to lump this all into sort of this hope that is tied to this, uh, you know, this political idol. Um, But I think we're going to have to identify some things. So I think before we even jump into the questions, we should probably talk about the big elephant in the room because everybody wants to, you know, try to get it out there and figure it out. But we need to talk about Christian nationalism. So I'm wondering if for the purpose of this podcast, you might have a working definition or you could maybe explain that a little bit to us help us understand it yeah what is and, christian nationalism yeah and I, and I think this would broadly i think this definition would also apply to other kind of political gospels um so really you know it's it's any movement by christians or purported christians right that believe they're bringing about a better christian society through political leaders and governmental legislation um, so, you, you know, you might have re- everything from like on one low end of the spectrum, kind of cultural Christians like God and country, kind of cultural Christians all the way to like theonomists and, and the very far end, right? That want to like a theocracy. Uh, Describe those for like the person going, what is a theocracy? What is the, what, right, yeah. give, me a, give me a quick definition of that. You know, so it's like uh, kind of kind of when you'd say like Jesus is president and and we're going to enact all the you know laws that we see in the Bible and we're going to we're going to dole out punishment that we see in the Bible to, uh, a, you know, according to God's moral law that he's revealed. So that's on the one far end. On the other end would be just kind of the like, you know, Lee Greenwood, like we Christ- love God and we and we love the country. Right. Yeah. Like, I was going to say, like, Christianity weirdly blended with serious uh, patriotism, yeah. which, yeah, God by bless the way, America, I mean, that's that's it. Right. Let's be really clear. Uh, God, sh- I, I pray God would bless America. Absolutely. Right? And and I do think it's good to be patriotic. I do think you should love Absolutely. the place you're at. I mean, there's a statement that's made to the to the Hebrew people. While they're in captivity, that said, pray for the blessing of the of Babylon. What's good for Babylon is actually going to be good for you. So, like, we yeah. should be hopeful that our country would do well. I don't think this is saying, right. let's just throw the country out. We shouldn't. Have, I mean, it's not that. It, yeah. What we're talking about is kind of that piece you brought about. Like, we're trying to bring something else into a reality through means that are, are just not how God defined Intended. that. Yeah. Right? And so. Yeah, so really it's it's placing a a, a hope for a better world. Um, it's making government the salvation of that better world. So if we get, you know, it's, it's in your mind, you're just going, if we could just get government right, the world would be great. Yeah. The, yeah. And, and, and the government can the government, be the mechanism to make the world great. Exactly. Right. And we making use, the world great of, means making it Christian. Right. Right. So, okay. So for those who are old enough to remember, um, and this stuff kind of just sounds similar to like the moral majority approach. If we can just get all the Christians, whether they're Catholic or, 
you know, charismatic or all of them. If we can just get as many people to say we want to all vote the same way. That, I mean, that was kind of a big one. Was that like 90s? I'm thinking was that in the 90s? The yeah. moral majority stuff, 80s and, and 90s, 80s yeah. and 90s. Same kind of idea. We're going to use this mechanism to bring about a better world here. And we're going to that mechanism, while we might love Jesus, might be more important to us than what Jesus might do. Um, he's made this as the means by which we're going to do all this. And and mm -hmm. so, again, politics, I mean, you, you wouldn't contend at your church where you preach that politics are bad, right? No, not at all. So it's not that we're talking about politics being I'm going to have a I have a political science degree. Uh it's not that we're saying don't vote. It's not that we're we're not thankful for our political systems and our and our government. It's just that we've we've slipped into allowing this to be some tremendous idolatry. I want to share a story yeah. um just cuz I have you on. I think this will be fun. I remember sitting under your preaching Many many years ago, uh, I'm gonna yeah. date. I'm gonna date both of us with what I'm about to say. But <laughs> I remember it was not too long after uh, a second term election and a president was reelected, and you know it was really spicy and contentious. And in your sermon, I, I, we were talking about providence and the sovereignty of God, and I can't remember what scripture you were preaching. I think it was out of Isaiah. Had something to do with the Babylonian captivity. I can't remember. You were talking about how God, you know, is sovereign over all these things. And you asked the question yeah. rhetorically, but then you answered it. But you said, you know who God voted for in the last election? Yeah. And uh, the whole, I mean, everybody piped up and were, was waiting to see what you would say. And you said, President Obama, because he's the one who won the presidency, right? So it was like, yeah. obviously, God didn't lose his choice on this. Yeah. And I remember there being some people that were so mad. <laughs> and they were irate that you would have said, "How you know, there's no way that God could have voted for that guy because God would have voted for my guy, you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think what we're talking about here is a recognition uh, that within the Christian view, God remains sovereign. God's using his means. We want to worship him supremely. We want to hold to a gospel that, that Christ is bringing about salvation either through or sometimes despite governments and government entities. We want to recognize there are governments all around the world <clears throat> that are doing all sorts of things, and God is sovereign over all of them, right? And God yeah. is bringing about whatever he's bringing about. But this thing that we're talking about is this idolatry piece that seems to be growing in popularity lately. <clears throat> I mean, this ebbs and flows, but that's what we're talking about. So yeah. let's go through our questions here. Um, and maybe, maybe, and I think... I think it'd be helpful to let's not be thinking about just the broad political spectrum. Let's talk about people that may actually identify as Christians or be pretty close to that. Let's keep it sort of yep. dialed into to that group. To folks who might say they are Christian, but wanting to bring about, you know, some kind of end game through a political gospel, how would they answer question one, do you think? Who is God? But what is God? I mean, it, they might not be fully aware but what's really playing out do you think in their mind yeah i mean I, it's I very think speculative they, yeah <clears throat> sorry in, in general right i mean and there are different poles to the spectrum um you know in general i think they think they they see god as as god and and kind of a, a morally important god um who has good things for us that they're trying to get at i think um that that they believe you know, God's plans for the world will be best. Um, so, so this so could be very, I mean, happen. This could be very much in line with the Bible. Then I'm mean, like, question one it, might be like, very much, yeah. We don't have to. I mean, that we're the whole issue here is it's it's not off unless you miss one of the questions. You could hit four and still miss one. Yeah, so yeah. So then the second question, like, what is man or who you is have man? A very, yeah, you could have a very good view of who God is. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, how about what is man? What do you well? Well, I think we might get a little crazy on who man is here because, um, you know, when we when we look to government um, to bring about the kingdom of God and the blessings of God, uh, and even our our position as voters in a democratic country, right? We we probably put at this point in, in the political gospel too much um, power in people to bring about change. 
right? So, so we're we're looking to human institutions, so people, to bring about the blessing of God, um, and and really, we might not look higher than that. Oh um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So like we're 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 really looking to our power as the people to vote in the right thing, and our power as people in government to enact the right thing and restrict evil and, and do all these sort of things. But okay, uh-huh. so what, what do you say to the guy? It's like, but aren't we, aren't we given the sword? Aren't we given, you know, the, the authority to enact that totally. power? So how, how would you respond to someone that says, well, who else, if we're, if we're not supposed to see man doing it, who are we supposed to see, you know, implementing the sword and who, what authorities yeah. are we supposed to be? How would you respond to that person? Yeah, and and these and these things do come through people, and even like um, in the church, like God's kingdom advances through um, people. But you know, the, the government. You know, one one thing we do with this, I think this might be a better way to say it. I think what we do here is mistake the role of the church with the role of government. Yeah, there so, you go. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So we're whereas people we're we're wanting. The, the secular institution of the government to really bring about the transformation that uh, God has said, I'm going to do through the church. And so while God is surely sovereign, and that's what I was referring to when we talk about who, who God voted for Obama, not because of his policies, mind you, um, but just because he's sovereign. Is because he was in people? office. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, God, God's, God's not going to lose Daniel. his God's not going to yeah. lose his vote. <laughs> yeah, and Daniel, God raises up who he wants, right? And he has yeah. purposes we don't realize. Um, but it's it's looking to people to bring out bring about the kingdom that only God says he can bring about through the church. So the church partners with God to bring about um, bring about the the kingdom. Where in the government, uh, God God has God has never declared this to be his mechanism, right? Um, like his perfect plan is the church. Um, and that's how he said he's going to bring about his kingdom. And so when we go to this other one, um, we're kind of left on our own to our own devices. Um, yeah. And we're or, not going to do the, well. Or the mechanism we created. Yeah. I mean, yes, God instituted this. God raises up and takes down leaders. But human beings came together and wrote the Constitution, for example. That's right. right? And hopefully yeah. they did a good job, but yeah, they I, did a decent job. Well, yeah, I think they did, but yeah. I, I, I'm wrestling with this. Who is man question when it comes to the political gospel, because I see man, I, I mean, I just can't get away from the fact that we're all a bunch of sinners. Yeah. We all have a ton of problems. And then what you tend to see, not always, but you tend to see all of a sudden people go, wait, my guy has no sin. Right. And there's this weird elevation of like, even though I might be a sinner, the people that I want to entrust in government, I see no sin in them, which I don't know how that's even possible. Right. Like, how do you they're on stage for all to see and we just see it. And and we've sort of created this misguided view that our leaders are going to be perfect and can do no wrong. And and there's no man on on the planet that's going to be free of that. You know, we're all sinners and we all have to wrestle with this reality. Um, So I struggle a little bit in that department going to question three so where do we so the questions I and mean, let's just hit them all really for the people who are listening who is god or what is god who is man where do we come from uh where are we going how do we get there and yeah. so question three and i want to add a little sub question to this but where do we come from i think the the big piece in the united states well first of all i'm going to ask you. I won't, I won't give the answers, but I'm going to break it into two parts. We have the where do we come from theologically? How did man get created? Who are we ultimately? But I want to ask too, besides that question, I sort of want to ask where did we come from in sort of our national history? Because I think that's a huge part of this question that then informs the rest of the questions. Right. Yeah. So, well, and they are, I mean, in this political gospel, I feel like they're one and the same because it's, I think, I mean, it, it usually, it, Usually assumes a theistic worldview and a and a uh, you know we're created by God and and we're in His image, et cetera, et cetera. But then it quickly moves; it jumps kind of over you know vast time and space to the history of America, 
Yeah. Be particularly in American context. It looks different in other contexts, but but this did happen kind of in Germany and and you know with Martin Luther, he kind of sparked a a Christian nationalism of Germany. Well, uh, you actually saw those guys fighting that out like crazy. Like, oh, totally. Oh, okay, so Calvin's the Calvin's the mayor, but now we're going to switch all of our theology and so now we have to oust Calvin. And then we're yeah. going to switch our theology back and now we have to bring Calvin back. Like they yeah. like they've they're super blended together, right? Yeah. So we jump quickly to our national history, and we we kind of look to it in folklorish, glorious eyes that we we founded this really righteous um, country, uh, and even the Puritans is a great book by Martin E. Marty about about early American religion in America, and uh, it talks about how the Puritans when they came over from England, like they really thought they were founding like the city on the hill, the new Jerusalem, the, this kind of eschatological Jerusalem. And so we have this national conscience uh, of this, that that we are like God's chosen country and we're going to show everybody how to do everything. And, you know, we're, we're extra Christian in our inception. And I think if you study Christ, or Christian history, see now I'm blending it myself. Yeah. <laughs> if you start, if you study American history, um, you'll quickly find that that you know many of our founding fathers were were for sure deists. Some of them likely not Christians at all, uh, and maybe even out for yourself, out for themselves, as we've talked about opportunists, right? Opportunists, Some of them yeah. were Christians, um, but but they came. They're coming out of this pure Puritan Puritanical background, as well as um coming in you know they're they're in a world that is culturally christian through and through and so you know these values get reflected though i think many of them may have been far from god themselves i well i think we i remember here thomas jefferson being a really good example he's a great example but i think these so the founding fathers always come into the mix we always talk about it we always say oh they're deists and then we just sort of brush that aside and go well okay but i'm sure I'm sure that the people were so much better than and, you know, and more moral and they all went to church and that's just what you did. But I remember hearing this fantastic history and I cannot remember. Yeah, I cannot remember who it was. I kind of think it might have been Stephen Nichols uh, talking about Edwards and what happened when he showed up at the church in where was he? Massachusetts. What was the church? Uh, was he in oh, New gosh. Plymouth? Where the heck was he? I anyway, can't, I, can't remember. I got. Yeah. I, I wish I had this dialed in. I wasn't thinking about this very much ahead of time. But he's talking through this, and he's talking about how by the way that Edwards was preaching and what he was doing, how people started flooding back to church, and it was like a small revival. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I've heard that story before. What you don't often hear is how few people were actually attending church on a Sunday and so the population of this town, which in your, our minds is like, oh, yeah, 90% of the people probably all go to church. It was in the single digits, like 5 or 6% of the whole town could be found in a church on a Sunday morning, right? Well, we don't put that sort of backdrop to our thinking. We think right. We think it's misguided. Well, so if we're going to get back to that, in a lot of our communities, that could be bad. That could be good yeah. in some communities like where yeah. you're at. But that could be bad in a lot of our communities, right? So yeah. So we just have to really get our head around this reality that that it's not what we think it was. We've it's no. so, we've, we've made it so rosy and probably really off, and we're trying to get back to something that we've created in our mind. It seems like. Yeah, and I and I think um, you know some other ways we kind of get messed, or at least how the Bible teaches us to think about this is like, yeah, sure, we're we're citizens of this world, right? But. Uh, like if you look at Philippians 3.20, Paul talks about how our citizenship is in heaven and we await a savior, right, who's going to transform our glorious or our lowly bodies into glorious bodies. So like, so it's saying, hey, we're members of something even greater than any of our memberships in um, in the world. St. Augustine talked about this as the two cities, right, the city of the world and the city of God. And so, um, so what... The political gospel does is supplant that a bit and says our government, you know, our our country citizenship is actually the saving citizenship. Where the Bible's like, no, there's like your citizenship in heaven through Christ, 
that's actually what will save us and transform us. Right. Uh, so we miss we confuse those two things in, in the political gospel. Okay. So so where are we going? That's the that's the question for you know. Here's where we came from. I think I think this gospel we kind of answer that. It's trying to bring all this about on earth now. They're yeah. trying to bring about Christ's kingdom by having his kingdom come through, say, the national kingdom we're we're creating, right? Like, yeah, we're trying to make his kingdom of this world instead of yeah, no, something else. you know, it has a it has a weird eschatology to it, right? So, like, so like you, you if you sit back and think about it, you have an eschatology in a in a political gospel that says things will get better and better, right? Yeah. Until we, I mean, it's almost kind of a post millennium kind of like. Yeah, you think we'll get better and better until we kind of slide into this perfected kingdom of God. It's, and it's, it's like all amazing and great. It's all amazing and great, and yet the Bible never leads us that direction. Which it, a lot of the people that hold to some of those views are post millennialists, and that's I mean yeah. that's, that's coming through the theology. I'm going to go one further and say it's actually a prosperity gospel. Yeah, because you're saying, it, hey, if God's really going to bless us, and if this is really going to come about, then life in the here and now is going to get so great. And that's going to be evidence that God's prosperity on our nation has made a good life for the Christians, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I think that's kind of what it is. Yeah, no, and there's definitely a piece of that. I think it also, you know, you mentioned it earlier, but but it looks to the the laws and rule of government to actually reform hearts, right? right. They're like, well, if we could just enact these certain laws that restrict these practices. Then people's minds and hearts will be changed, and we and we'll and then we'll go into that piece you talked about. Now we'll be doing the right thing, and now we'll get the blessing of God, yeah. right? And everything will be happy and rosy. But it's like you're missing that the gospel says that there there's nothing that will change your heart. In fact, we learn you know the Mosaic law, and in Galatians, Paul talks about this law actually inflames our heart to do the wrong thing. Right, exactly. And so like. So all it does is show us our sinfulness and we sin all the more. So we're looking to government to employ God's law, which actually just makes us all mad. And, uh, and, and sinful and recognize our sin. And we sin more. Yeah. Yep. So like instead of looking to the gospel to actually change hearts and minds, which only comes through the, the church. Okay. So question five in this is how do we get there? It's And I want to come back around to all these. How do we get there is we, <clears throat> excuse me. Either there's a few different bents to the political gospel. We get our people elected, or we elect the right people in some way, or we just circumnavigate the election altogether and push for all these things, you know, that are God's law that we see fit. Or, I mean, I, some of these individuals will say, "Well, even just going to rebel and you know almost throw out what is and create a new government." That that uh, theonomist view, maybe you were talking yeah. about, or something like that. Uh, so how we get there is all in the here and now. And it's all through either legal political process, illegal political process. A lot of it is through protest and campaigning and sort of a skewed vision. I don't know. What am I missing here? I think that's kind of the how no, we get to I think this you're view. giving, I mean, we were touching on that a bit, right? I think how do we get there? One is, as you said, kind of on this this spectrum, like enact the laws that will that will change people and things, right? That uh, Or get your candidate in there because he will change it and make it better and and i think it, it actually shows the sickness of our heart that that we would say uh or at least our where our hope lies we don't even care if the candidate's really great or not he can right. be immoral, immoral whatever but we just want to get him in there because he'll enact the laws we think are good uh so that that just betrays our where our hope really is like our hope is in that these laws will change people it's like that yeah. that doesn't work and then, as you said, and then revolt is kind of on the far end of that. Like, well, let's just overthrow everything and usher in this new kingdom. Um, so we're talking, and I mean, most Christians, I think, I hope so, don't have this political ideology, you know, idolatry just hovering over their head all the time. They're not. Right. I think. I think this is a. You know, this isn't like every Christian is thinking this. So I think what we should try to do here is maybe bring into the perspective, how do we as Christians who aren't seeing the political thing as idolatry actually still submit to the authorities that are appointed over us, pray for our leaders, all these biblical things? How do we, how do we obey God well 
without going all the way to the far side of this political gospel thing. Like, obviously, you would you would encourage people to vote, right? I'm assuming. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Do absolutely. you do you feel compelled that you need to tell them who to vote for as a pastor? Do you are you one of those pastors no, that not even in the slightest? But you think they should exercise their Holy Spirit filled, informed absolutely. conscience to vote. And um, I, and I would need to go further, Brian. I'll inflame some people with this one, but. Oh there no! Is, there is no one right political party. Right. You could you could be a Christian and be a Republican. You could be a Christian and be a Democrat. You 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 could be a Christian and be an Independent, and and you could be convinced and make biblical arguments on why those parties, pluses and negatives, make the most sense for our world and out of a Christian worldview. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah. And, and so. so I, I think, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> I think what happens is people go, well, this particular issue is the litmus test. Yeah. All right. Well, what's interesting is when you watch both parties start flirting with the litmus test, then what do you do? Wait a That's minute. Right. They're both they both looking for who's going to capture the most votes, right? So now what do you do? So I think I think this is something that we need to hold a lot looser than this party's the Christian party and this party isn't. And, totally. you know, I, this well, gets or, really or, complicated. Or, I mean, I'll, I'll take one, you know, like abortion's always kind of our, our flagstone, like, uh, Which or, is a very important issue. Very like, important issue. And I have, uh, yeah, very important issue. Um, but, so that would be on the Republican side. On the other side, it might be the environment for Democrats. And if you if you think certain things about the environment, which one's killing more people? I don't know. Right, right. right. And so, like, which, which one is actually better for our world? I, I don't know. These things uh, are complex, right? I don't right. like people dying in either one of those equations. Which... The hard part is we take these really big things and, and we make those the things and we miss that there's actually quite a bit more to governance than yeah. than these litmus tests. So um, yeah. I think ultimately, I think we need to hold our political things a lot looser than maybe than maybe um, this idol tries to tempt us to hold them. Well, you know? I and I think I'll just I'll say this too. I think we can take our, our cue from from the biblical text. Like, I, I think at no point do you find any involvement in with Jesus or Paul in trying to bring about God's kingdom through government. In fact, you you find quite a bit of apathy towards the government. I mean, Jesus is like, hey, you know, pay your taxes to Caesar. And what's Caesar doing? He's aborting babies and he's waging unjust wars and he's worshiping pagan idols and jesus says yeah fund it because i told you to right um, and but his focus is on building the kingdom of god through the church and yet we see both of them at times use the government to their advantage as they're working to build the kingdom of god paul does this right i mean he defends yeah. himself through caesar he goes through the political process but he's not looking to reform government he's actually ushering in god's kingdom through the church well god god Hold Paul, you're going to stand before leaders, right? You're going to yeah. go through all this stuff. And so what Paul's actually doing when he says, for example, I appeal to Caesar, I'm like, oh, he probably, you know, we could have let him go, but he appealed to Caesar. So now on, on Caesar's dime with guard and all this other stuff, he's now sharing the gospel in Rome and being transported through all this stuff. And, and, and so I think it's important to remember that there are tremendous opportunities with things like these various government entities and program but we have to keep the gospel in the forefront of all of it right the, the biblical gospel that's right um i I'm, I'm trying to I'm try, like when you the, when you and, see, and i think when we ahead. say the i would say when we say the biblical gospel i would kind of put these points to it in this realm like law doesn't transform people grace does there right? you go yeah that's, i was trying to get to that like so how like, do you tell people yeah. what is the end game for the christian here yeah. Grace. That's it. Gospel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Law doesn't transform people. Grace does. God's plan is not government. Jesus was never, is not a governmental reformer. He is a church starter. Right? Yeah. He's a church builder, right? I'll build he's my a church. church builder. <laughs> and he's building his kingdom through the church. I mean, he lays this out. And so I think those are the things, the big kind of pillars we have to keep in our mind as we think about um, government. And like we've said throughout this, does that mean you should be uninvolved in government? Absolutely not. Like, I care about this country, should care about it, should vote my conscience. And Paul says, you ought to decide in your head. And if you haven't decided on an issue, 
then to act on it without having deciding would be sin. Yeah. Right. So decide what you think on things and vote that direction. And you're in, you're the way our government system is structured, unlike what Paul was under. We don't have a dictatorship. We have a government that expects the people would have a voice and speak. So That's therefore, right. if you're going to submit to your government and the authorities appointed over you, you do need to have a voice and speak. Yeah. You just need to make sure that you haven't put your idol, uh, you know, out in front of all this. You're not the ambassador of your idol. You're the ambassador yeah. of God in this, right? That's it's a tricky balance. It's You're hard. not making it an idol of salvation, right? That government will transform people and transform our country, right? I mean, and it's all just it's it's fleeting. It's yeah, and it passes away. It passes away. Um, okay, and, and well, also God will. I mean, a good example comes out of Isaiah. Sorry to take a little tangent here, but no, you're good. A good example comes out of Isaiah. Like, you know, God has always said He will hold rulers accountable and so like when you have a syria that punishes israel god used them to punish israel there's god voting for a bad country to do really well and then yet they do it in their own pride and their own arrogance and so then god judges them Ju for yeah. what they did yep right so it's like so sometimes we have to hold the the judgment against the parties that we think are doing wrong we have to place that in god's hands too Right. Do what you think is right. Fight for the right things. Vote for the right things. But don't get upset if God allows the enemy a day in the sun for a while, all the while while he's withholding his judgment and will bring it about at some point. And working out his will, how he sees best fit. Exactly. Right. Like he's got a plan. You're not him. Let him work his plan. Be OK with that. Yeah. Be OK. That do, be good. Do the, yeah. I always forget where this is, but I, I've wanted to write something on it a long time. But um it's right when the last king of Israel and all the people in Israel and Jer I think it's Jeremiah that comes to him and says, hey, look, guys, like the king of Babylon is coming and he's going to wipe out everybody. Right. God has told me to tell you this. So you need to you need to be prepared because that's going to happen. And if not, you're going to die. And they're like, no way. We'll never let our guy be off the throne. Like we're, we're with this last king. We're, we're going to do it in our own strength. <laughs> And he says, that's great, but God said that's not happening, and you're going to yeah. pay the price. Yeah. So it's kind of, I always think about it as being on the wrong side of the right thing, right? Yeah. This is a tough one. This is a tough one that requires a lot of thought. Um, yeah. Hey, I want to encourage that if you're in the Utah area, uh, we're out of time, go see Jared. Go see Pastor Jared. You could talk with him personally. If you're in Nebraska, South Central Nebraska, I'm in Holdridge, which is like the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. feel free to come chat with me or send me an email saltybeliever at gmail.com hey since you had mentioned Isaiah I've been doing a, a little summary verse uh, of the gospel in all of these I'm going to go to Isaiah 53 5 which I think is a great summary verse of the gospel and we'll end with that uh, Isaiah 53 5 says but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed until next time. Thanks for listening. Salty Believer Unscripted is a production of SaltyBeliever.com. Visit the website to find more resources like the podcast you've just listened to. 